So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over that their hearts melted. And there was no spirit in any of them long, any longer because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make yourself sharp flint knives for yourself and then circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made the knives and circumcised the sons of Israel on the hill of the foreskins. That means at foreskin hill. The Jews call it foreskin hill. Just like you would say something in the army, a hill. It's where it took place. And this is the reason why Joshua did this. Because all the people who came out of Egypt were males, who were males. All of the men of war, every soldier, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness saying, we don't need this anymore. Who were the men of war? They said the same. Those who came out of Egypt were consumed. They fell dead. They dropped dead because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to them by their fathers that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. Now, I know that you'll say, boy, you use a lot of that C word there. But I'm going to talk to you just, I'm, I'm going to give you highlights. I just got to do it this way because you got to have it, okay? You can get the real thing later on if you want to. But I want you to hear the highlights. I want you to be seated. I want you to listen. I want you to see yourself going across. I want you to see yourself going across. If there is one thing that is missing in the church today, I'll tell you what it is. It's not choir. It's not robes. It's not instruments. It's not the machines. It is the everlasting power of the supernatural God. Amen. And you and I know as sure as you're sitting there in your pew that that is a thing that's missing in our church services. That, Lord, if we don't have anything, if we have to get down to where we punch a little thing and say we sing like that or that we preach like this with somebody else doing it or whatever it is, that we would not suffer to lose anything if we have one touch of the supernatural God to come into our life, to touch our lives and to heal us and to make us humble ourselves before him so that we could say, it's not the preacher, it's not the deacon, it's me, O oh Lord, that stands. I want to hear you clap your hands. Come on. It's me that stands in the need of prayer. It is a missing element in the church. We walk into the church and we say, Oh, it's a dead church. I've heard it so many times. And really the dead thing is not the church at all. It's not the music. It's not the singing. It's not the preaching. The dead thing is us. The dead thing is you. And we need to look at ourselves and say, Lord, I want you to make me lie, alive. I want, you to, I want you to sharpen me, Lord. I want you to hone me. I want you to fill me. I want you to make me like your presence and make me like your spirit. For Lord, that's why I have come to church today. And when you come up from the grave, when you come up from that deadness, when you come into the land of living that is flowing with milk and honey, this is what God wants us to do. Don't be impatient and run and say, I'm going to knock those walls down, give them to me. I can knock them out for Jesus. Oh, no, it's not the time to do that. The time to do that is to get the victory first in your own life before you get the victory over somebody else. For there is always, after you get a blessing, I've seen it here, after reading it 40 or 50 times, there is a Gilgal. We don't even like to look at the little word because it means the reproach was rolled away. It amazes me how in church we can go to church Sunday after Sunday and year after year and we can deal with the reproach that comes in our lives. 
And we can come and we can look good and we can have our suits of clothes on and everybody looks good and smells good and acts good. But on the inside, we know that we're as dead as anybody ever was because we profess one thing and we possess another thing. And we know that the one missing thing is the power of Almighty God. And we are like putting a little boat out there and hooking it up with a rope and drive and hanging it on to the, to the post, onto the dock and sending it out a little bit and then jerking it back. We're afraid to let God go. I remember one time, not just one time, somebody sat in the service and said, oh, I just loved it. I almost shouted today. I almost said amen today, hypocrite. I want to tell you this. When God moves in your life, don't you let go. Don't you fail to let go. You just let it go if God moves in your life. Don't you hold God back and quench the power of the Holy Spirit. You let the Lord move in your life. That's where the Holy Ghost is born. It's not in you. It's not in me. It's by almighty power and spirit of almighty God. That's where it comes from, the whole future of this church. I say it again to you, the future of Northwood Temple. It depends upon this. I know that I won't be here with you. Some of the others won't be here either. I know that I won't be here, but I want you to know that it is not just partly that we are needing today or just a touch. We need everything that God has, and he is everything that we need. It's not a little bit more of talent, not a little bit more of gift, and not a little bit more of tune, and not a little bit more of honing, and not a little bit more of preach, and not a little bit more of shouting. It's the power of Almighty God in our life, the righteousness of God, and he wants to take us down through the river and bring us to the other side. And before you're going to have that, even though you've got the victory, You've got to let a little reproach go from you. I'm going to ask you plainly today. I'm your pastor for right now. I'm what you got. But I'm going to ask you, is there anything in your life that's bringing reproach on the kingdom of God? You'd say, how dare you would come into a holy place like that and say that. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you've got. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what's behind closed doors. I've never looked at your, at your medicine cabinet. I've never looked in your shelf. I've never looked in your bed. I've never looked in your bedroom. I would never do that. But you know what it is, and Almighty God knows. And he who puts you down on this earth, he's writing it all down. And I'm not the keeper of the gate. I won't say you can't come in or you can't. It's the Almighty God who's the keeper of the gate, and he knows exactly who you are today. So don't try to play games with God, mister, because you can't do that and get by with it. Gilgal is a place of remembrance. I know it is. I'm going to give you the R's and you can remember them. It's a place of remembrance. Everybody say remember. It's a place where we can remember, but it's also a place where we can have resurrection. Everybody feels it say resurrection. They went down, and when they went down, they went down into the bedrock, and they came up, uh, uh, new people on the other side, and all went down with the priest and the Ark of the Covenant, and all went out before the water ever receded and it ever, ever came back. You understand that, and it's the same thing with us. Standing between the world and you is one thing. It's that thing like the cross that you see right here. You can't get by without it. You can get by with other things, without other things, but you can't get by without the cross. I mean, I'll tell Paul that, and Paul told us that we all had to have that cross. He said it's a New Testament thing that we've got to have the preaching of the cross, and without the preaching of the cross, we're lost. You'd say, well, all this circumcision junk that you're talking about, that's not New Testament, is it? Well, I want to tell you that Paul told the same people, just like you and me, who were at the little town of Colossae. He says, you are circumcised in the heart, and you need something to be circumcised in the heart. You need to go into the Holy of Holies, into the operating room, and see the surgeon standing there. And the surgeon that does the operating on the heart is none less than the power of the Holy Spirit, that third person in the triune Godhead, God the Holy Ghost. Let him come in and let him do it. Paul said it's like this. He said, and you are complete in him, which is ahead of all principality and power, in whom you also are, listen, here it is, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh so that you can have the circumcision of Christ in your heart. Moses came along. He had his right of circumcision, and it was his trademark of his discipleship. John the Baptist came along and he was baptizing and baptism became the trademark of his discipleship. Jesus came along and said, we don't need that and we don't need this, maybe just objects of it, parts of it. And Jesus said, my way is going to be something that you can have and it is the cross of Jesus Christ. It never dies, it never goes away, it's always standing, it's in every continent, on every continent, it's in every country, it's in every church and there's a, a little bit of a crowd in every church, a seed that's there that says it will not die, it will not 
go down because the power of Almighty God is like a seed and it will grow. And it's growing in you. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. I'm trying to tell you something this morning through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to rejoice this morning for a while. Put your hands up in the air and clap your hands and shout glory unto the Lord. But it's a place also, and I want you all to know this. It's not just a place where we go and we are remembering. We all live in our past. We know what we did in the past. We say, man, the past is something. I'm just going to cling to the past. You can't cling to that past but so long. The past is gone. The last 50 years are gone. The last 53 years of this church are gone. You're not going to get back to that. What is happening right now is not the future, but the present right now. And you've got to be willing to look backwards in order to look forward. And you never look more forward than you can look backwards. Then you look at yourself and you say, Lord, today is mine. It's a gift. It's a present. And Lord, I want to stand in your power and I want to be what you want me to be. And God says, all of the present is yours. I want you to have everything that I want you to have. You are complete in him. And now I want you to know that there's one thing that you've got to do. Because I want you to know that standing between you and that world is a cross, my cross. And my blood is there and it washes away every sin that you've ever had. And it's not any time and so many times that you can climb the stairs to get up to God or you can give enough tithes to get to him or you can give enough gifts or you can come enough times or you can read the Bible through enough times or you can be in church enough times. I don't have to do that. If I want to go to heaven and be what God wants me to be, I have to have the supernatural working of Almighty God in my life. And you're not going to have the supernatural working of Almighty God in your life. And I'm not unless we renounce some of the things that we know are lingering in our heart. Don't play games with God, sister. You can't do that. Don't play any games with him. Some of us are playing. I'm speaking as God wants me to speak right now. I got the notes, but I can't deal with the notes right now. We're, we're treating God just like he's an object. You put him on the back, in the back burner, and then on Sunday morning, we come out and we sing, and we pray, and we do a few things, and we go through all these calisthenics, and we, we make believe we've got it. But on the inside, we're missing the supernatural power of Almighty God. God wants you and me to come alive in him and allow the Holy Ghost to work. And there's nothing wrong with you that the Holy Ghost will not cure. Glory, hallelujah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I think it's time that you in the pew understood that you're in this church also. And I'm not here to entertain you. And I'm not here to jump at you. And I'm not here to make you feel good or to make you feel bad. I'm here to give you what saith God. And this is what God says. What saith God? It is that he wants you to turn from your wicked way and turn unto him and get rid of these things that are in your life and shuck those things and renounce those and let them go in Jesus' name. You say, I ain't heard nothing like this. Paul preached it so strong that he said, I want everybody who's got Ouija boards. I want every divination. I want everything that is wrong. Any kind of little gods that you've got in Ephesus, he said, I want you to bring it together. And we're going to burn it. They piled it up in the front of everybody and dying of the goddess. Put the kerosene or the creosote under it and burnt those things. And it was a fortune. And Paul said, now this is what we've got to do. We've got to let our hearts be so circumcised that we will not allow anything to slip in our life that's going to, going to control our life. You'd say, well, preacher, I got news for you. Nothing controls my life. Don't count on that. Some things are controlling your life, and you and I know it. If I never said another word to y'all as a congregation, you can't live on yesterday. You can't live on those blessings of Jerry B. Walker. And you can't live on, on uh, all the blessings of, of H.L. Moore and all these others. You can't live on the things that just David Jeremiah says on the, on the television. You can't live on Billy Graham, he said, but you can live in the present. And it's not me. It's the power of Almighty God that you... What is wrong with me today? You need to live on the power of the Holy Ghost. Show me Jesus. Roll my sleeves up. I'm, I'm across the Jordan now. I'm going to go knock those walls and I can get them, boy. And that's where your mistake is. That's where your mistake is. 
because you want to get one little victory and say, we can get it now, and I've got all the power in the world, and that power becomes in you. Did you not know that God is not seeking the most powerful one here today, that he's seeking somebody who says, listen, I am nothing, because he takes the small things of life, and he con confounds the great and mighty things. He's looking for people who will just say, listen, Lord, I'm nothing, but Lord, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. That's what God is looking for today. He's looking for people who will say, listen, I renounce everything today, Lord. Anything that's in my life, it ought not to be there. I renounce it and get rid of it. Now, I want to tell you this. It takes guts to say this to the best crowd that you'll ever find anywhere in the country. And I know that you probably say, I wish that next week would be a final with you. But I'm going to tell you what God said. He said, yea, saith God. You are hiding some things in your life. And you're preventing the move of the Holy Spirit. You're crowding into the church, I say it from God. You're crowding into the church and you're saying, oh, I've got everything. And when really you're dead on the inside. Allow me to come and live in your life and allow me to bring a new life in your life. Let me breathe on you the power of the Holy Spirit. For you are everything in me and all you have to have is some of me today and everything is yours. Oh, says God. Renunciation. It's not a word you use, it's an old English word. Renunciation. Well, Lord Jesus, now you know that I've got everything and I've got all the liberty because I can do anything that I want to. I can be a member of the Saints Delight. I can be a member at the Holy Temple. I can be a member of Hollywood Temple at Northwood Temple. And I can do everything I want to because I'm free. I'm freed up in the Lord. You're not freed in the Lord. You're freed from the world so that you can be a slave to Jesus Christ. Paul never got there and said, I'm free from all these things. He said, I want you to know that now I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I am now no longer under law because that thing that happened at the cross has freed me from the, from the power and the sins of the law and the control of the law. You're not under the law anymore. You're free to serve the Lord. That's what you means. you're free. You're free to be in him. Because Paul said, the power of the law will not hold me down anymore. And he said, now you are free from it. Read Romans a little bit and get into it and read the word of God. And that's why he said, you're dead now to the law. It can't point its finger at you and say that you're wrong anymore. And he said, while I'm at it, let me just go ahead with something else. So that you can understand it better, he said, and now there is now no more condemnation to them who are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but who walk in the power of the, the Holy Spirit. No condemnation. Say it with me. Come on. No condemnation. You go around, you say, oh, he's condemning me so much, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just so condemned. I'm just so condemned. You're not condemned anymore. You're free to serve the Jesus Christ. But you're not free to go and, you're not free to go and hurt his name and go and free to, to, uh, to be without him like you, like you are. He wants you to be free in him so that you can now say, I'm free to serve the Lord. I'm complete. I stand in him complete. I'm his righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God. In fact, I think you ought to preach with me one time. I could use some help right now. Go ahead, do it. Come on. I am the righteousness of God. Boy, they're strong, aren't they? Can you join with them? Come on, let's do it. Come on. I am. I am the righteousness of God. Say it again. I am the righteousness of God. You're complete in him. You don't have to get sister foul mouth to come and tell you. You don't have to get brother blackjack to come and tell you. You don't have to have brother flap jaws to come and preach it to you. You know where you are today. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm free to serve the Lord like God wants me to serve. I give it to him. I renounce it. Jesus said, you know you've been wrong for 40 years. And that's what God said to them. He said, you're not going busting through there to tear any walls down yet. You're going to fall on your face. He said, before you do that, you've got to have a refreshing. I'll give you another one. How about that one? Uh, you've got to have a real refreshing. Some of you have been such a long time, and it's a, it's a, it's a slap on me, I know. But, but to say that you haven't been refreshed in a long time, you have to go somewhere else to get refreshed by the Spirit because you don't have enough to get it at home, and you don't study enough, and you don't put anything into it. So you fail to be fresh, refreshed. He told those people, he said, don't you run off like that. You're going to fall. We want walls to fall. 
not you to fall. You say, well, I thought he already had a blessing. Why would he take it away from him? For every positive, there's a negative. In, in math and in, in physics and everything, every positive, there's a negative. He said, you're already through, but now we're going to have a negative. I want you to renounce something. You didn't obey me when you went across the Red Sea. You said, the Red Sea's behind us, and I've got everything in front of me. We don't need to do that anymore because we're free. We don't have to be circumcised anymore. So they went 40 years. And every man that wasn't circumcised dropped dead. That came out of Egypt, of course. Then it says he took the young men and all of the army that was with him, those that were young. And he says, now we're going to go and we're going to have a place over yonder. And they took all day probably, two or three days probably. But on that day, they got ready for something that was about to come. It was the Passover time. They had only observed it one time since they came out. One time in, in Egypt down at Goshen when the death angel passed by. And now the second time down at, uh, down at Mount Sinai, they did it, but no more than 40 years. They said, we don't need it. We don't need it. We don't need refreshing. We got ourselves. We got manna for the little, little, little coming down. We got quails. We got everything. We don't need anything else. They did that. And God said, but you know I have manna to feed you that you know not of. And I want you to know that I'm going to anoint you with the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to refresh you. I want everybody to say refresh. But the refreshing at the table doesn't come until you do the renouncing at the altar. To say, Lord, I give this to you. Lord, I yield up my rights. I yield up my control. I yield up myself. I give everything to you, Lord. I let it go right now, Lord, and I will not hold on to it anymore. I turn it over to you. I recall that at the end of the 40th year, I made my way down to Myrtle Beach that day, and the bishop was having a meeting with the uh, about 30 or 40 pastors who had good-sized churches in our denomination. I slipped into the Marriott and was sitting over the back just hoping just to be there a little while. And the leader who was from California said, John, it's great to have you here today. He said, I want to ask you one question for these men. Would you tell these men what is the only the biggest, greatest thing that you've learned in 40 years here at Northwood Temple, there at Northwood Temple? What is it? And I said, man, I've learned a lot of things, but what is the greatest? And I said to him these words. I said, sir, the greatest thing I've learned in 40 years is that once you think you've got control of it, you just lost it. That just went on by some of you. You don't understand it. Neither did I understand it either. Once you think that you've got control and you say, I got control, I got it under my hand. Listen, that's the moment you just lost the control. Understand this. A few weeks later, you had Steve Green up here. You remember Steve Green? We were walking around the perimeter, and I told Steve what had happened. Steve said, yes, sir, John. He said, Pastor, I do not believe that God ever expects you to have control of the church or have control of the ministry or any of us to have control of the ministry because when we've got control, we're going to say, man, I've done a good job, and then you're going to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what they had done in the wilderness, and that's what they thought they had done when they were worthy of coming across that 100-yard-long uh, that uh, wide uh, Jordan River and getting to the other side. Now we got it, but we show the world who we are. And he said, just one thing you lack I want you to get out, and I want you to repent, and I want you to get refreshed, but you're not going to be refreshed until you observe this holy communion. And he said, once you start to observe it, and once you observe the command that I've given you to be circumcised, then the reproach will be rolled away, as he says, Gilgal means. But when they said, where are y'all now? Where are you camping? They said, we'd say they camped in Gilgal, but they didn't say that. They said, we're encamped at reproach rolled away. Let it roll. Let it roll away. And when it rolls away, you'll look up to him and you'll say, now, Lord God, I've done what you said. Now, give me your blessing and let the power of your body flow through me with healing and let the power of your blood flow over my life and cleanse me and wash me and sanctify me and make me whiter than snow. Get on your feet, everybody, okay? Now, understand what I've said to you today. I know it comes from many hours of prayer. 
If you don't know that, you've really missed it. It comes from many hours of prayer. I'm willing to take a chance with you. But I want to beg you as your pastor, get right with God. You say, you don't believe in us. I believe in you. Listen, if I didn't believe in you, I'd have been gone a long time ago. I want you to know that. Because I've had my chances to go and you've had yours. The only thing is that I signed on and I said, I cannot go until you finish with me there. But I'm imploring you. Listen, I'm beseeching you. I'm importuning you to get right with God. You're going to say, well, you know it. Oh, no. God's going to know it, and you're going to know it. Get circumcised in the heart. Well, how do I do that? Here's what you do. It's a spiritual thing. Pretend that you've just gone into the surgery room, the operating room, the OR. That's the only place you can't go into. Remember that. They're not going to invite you in if you're with somebody. Tommy Chester's wife had a heart attack two nights ago, a big heart attack. They took her in the operating room. When they got ready to go in the operating room, they said, Mr. Chester, Reverend Chester, you stay out here. He only takes the patient in because he doesn't want anybody else to crowd it and, and get it all messed up and confuse it. He's standing right now at the OR. The light is on. It's coming on, flashing for you. You're on the gurney. You're coming down the aisle. You're coming fast. I know those guys that carry you over there. I've been in it myself. All of a sudden, they hit a little key, and bam, that door opens wide open. And Faye says, John, I'm going in with you. They put that arm out and close it, and they say, ma'am, you're going to have to stay out here. They said the same thing to me when they got ready to operate on the hip. I felt like I could operate on a hip. I'd seen it so many times. And I'd already bought the three screws that come from downtown over here at Ace Pawn Shop. At about that long. I could put those, hip, those screws in the hip. I know I could. But they said, we don't want you. We've got a surgeon by the name of Schaefer who's going to do it for you. We'll come and talk to you in a little bit. Here's her number, 53825. Look up there and we'll tell you where she is. And here you come down the aisle right now and you say, oh, no, no, Lord, I want so-and-so. I want Dr. Price. I want, I want one of the board members. I want Larry. I want, I want Faye. I want, I want uh, Mike. I want Kerwood. I want someone. You got to go. They got to go. I want them. Could I please have them to go with me? He says, only you. Only you. And the door shuts. And when he gets you there, you've got to be willing to lay down and say, Lord, use a scalpel on me and carve me and take away anything that ought not to be there. Now, if you say, Lord, you can have all of this, but this part, God takes the part that you're the most vulnerable at. And that is the thing that gives you life, that, but yet gives you weakness so that you can walk out like they did and say, in our weakness, we ran down the walls of Jericho. <laughs> So that you can say, in that weakness, we have overcome. And now we can mow down anything because we've been through the room and the reproach is gone. He said, now you boys, it's tough to see a grown man cry. I've seen it, haven't you? But have you seen about 50,000 of them cry at one time? All I got to say is that was a lot of operating. He must have everybody around there, all of his surgeons. They had two and a half million people. They had 40,000 out of three tribes, two and a half tribes that were soldiers, and every one of them got it. Every last one of them. That's why they called it, please do not think I'm earthy. That's why they called it the hill of the foreskin. Piled up out there. And it says on that 14, listen to this. You can forget the other things, but listen to what it said. On the 14th day of that month, when they all came up 
They all were resurrected and they got to the other side and a miracle on the 14th day. It was the Passover. And I want you to observe the Passover with me. Passover. Don't you do it unworthily. Don't you hide behind that thing. So, well, Lord, I know that you just forgive me because I'm so sweet and I'm one of the chosen frozen. I'm going to ask God right now. I need it more than you do. I mean it. I need it more than you do. You say, every preacher's no, they don't either. You don't know me. Man, if I lined up to put my sins on the cross, look, sir, it would take me 24 hours just to get a half of them there. I don't have to do that. You see, I've already been nailed to the cross because I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And this life that I now live, I live by power of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. I'm alive forevermore. I'm on this earth. But I'm sitting in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2. And I got his ban over me, his love. And right now, I'm as good there with my spirit as you are sitting in that pew right now. And Jesus is at the honored right hand. And anything the devil throws against me, Jesus says, don't worry, I'm here. And the devil says, I know she did it like this. I know he did it like this. He was over there and he saw somebody and he lusted after him. I got him, Lord. You know what you got to do with sin. And there I am. I step before him and God says, what's your plea, sir? And I say, Father, Your Honor, I have retained an attorney, and he's sitting at your right hand. And he goes to the place where my sins are written, and with the blood that you're going to get in a minute, he splings it down there again, splashes it. And I can say, what can wash away my sins? Say it, nothing. You know that. Come on, everybody. Nothing. Say it, but the. Everybody together, come on. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen to him. What can make me whole again? Come on, say it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, glory. Playing it. Listen. Oh, precious. Come on. Oh, precious. Is a flow that makes me white as snow. Say it, no other fount I know. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious, come on. Oh, precious.